You're watching Global Trade This Week with Pete Mento and Doug Draper. This is the uh, Monday edition of Global Trade This Week. I'm Doug Draper, and with me is my power co-host, Pete Mento, out in New Hampshire. Pete, what's going on, man? Not much. I like how you call me your power co-host. That makes me feel like, you know, we've really built something here, pal. We have. We made it to our second season. So before we jump into it, just a little recap to uh, our audience. Global Trade This Week is all about international trade, little transportation. We sprinkle in some uh, economic news, and obviously it's all brought to you by Cap Logistics. They're the ones that are working the board behind the scenes to make it work. Uh, Please visit them at caplogistics.com. And uh, as we usually do, we have two topics each. We're going to buzz through them, give some feedback, some insight, and always keep the uh, vision forward thinking, which is, uh, which is the whole play here, Pete. So, hey, thanks for taking the lead. I was uh, indisposed and on assignment, I guess, as they say in the media world. So uh, thanks for holding down the ship last, uh, last Monday. Yeah, thanks for making uh, my life hell for a good 30 minutes when I yeah. had to come up with two opinions to everything I talked about on my own. I felt like I was a little bit bipolar, honestly, Doug. It was, um, it was tough. Um, but you know, it went okay. I had a lot of people asking me where you were, if you had quit, if I had finally Mm -hmm. driven you away from the show, if my shenanigans and silliness had finally driven you away. I said, no, he just went on vacation. Uh, where did you go anyway? What did you do? Uh, we went into the beast, uh, uh, the belly of the beast down to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So my, oh. my wife's a teacher. She had spring break and we thought we'd catch the back half of spring break. Nope. It was uh, Fort Lauderdale beach. I don't think it was Miami beach esque, but it pretty close. And, uh, you get a couple of old farts zipping around and we were definitely out of our element a little bit, but ha- had a heck of a good time. And the funny thing, Pete, when I was down there, um, I, I, checked out i intentionally did not answer any emails didn't communicate and the funny thing is when i came back the world had not imploded and everything was moving forward and uh, i I may be important but i'm not that important so if you're planning on going vacation turn off uh eject and be present that's what i did and i had a great time so thanks for running the show that last week i'm telling you it's april and you're still doing well with that uh with that new year's resolution of being present of being there Mm -hmm. doug i'm so proud of you man Way to go. Yeah. Yeah. The last thing before we jump in, and I'll probably have you go with the first one here, but, you know, being down in Florida, I was able to able to get into the port a little bit. And there, and there were actually I spoke to a, a, a captain. And the weirdest thing is, he said during the Suez Canal uh, debacle, there were three songs that were playing on the loop with most of the vessels out there. Mm-hmm. And it was weird. Hey, I'm not making this up. This is what the captain told me. It was Son of a Son of a Sailor mm-hmm. by, by Jimmy Buffett, right? A Pirate Looks at 40 and Redneck Yacht Club. Oh. That was the loop that was happening with all the vessels that were waiting. So I, I don't, I guess I should believe him. I'm not really sure about that, but three good songs that yeah, were yeah, rocking. Yeah, on the first two, bud. I, I love those first two, you know, as a sailor myself, but that last one, I can skip it. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. There you go. Well, first well, topic uh, this week on uh, Global yeah, this it. week brought to you by our good friends at Cap Logistics is a weird one, and it keeps popping up. And when we had all of our troubles with the Suez Canal, it got a lot of love in the media, uh, particularly in social media. If you were looking on on um, LinkedIn in particular, a lot of people were talking about the reinvigoration of the Arctic route, um, probably I think 2018 or so. The Russians had brought up this idea of recommercializing the Arctic route between Asia and Europe using their uh, bevy, if you will, of icebreakers to clear that route for the months that it's available. It's only available for three months out of the year to move cargo from Asia to Europe. It is a shorter route for people who aren't aware. When you look at a map right now, that's a Mercator projection. It's not a, it's not a real... Um, accurate portrayal of the distances from one place to another it's a it's a look at a map if you were to um, project on it and then lay it flat it's not how it actually looks in distances those continents and those places are not as large as they look when you look at it that way some real problems with using this route 
that are just, they just make sense from it if you think of it logically, Doug. One of the big ones is it's a dangerous place to operate. If something goes wrong up there, even in the warmest of months, falling in the water is a death sentence. Um, a second part of it is uh, the wind and the waves and the tide makes it a very expensive place, even at a shorter route to operate. And a third, of course, is insurance concerns. Icebergs are not, you're probably going to hit something along the way that could do damage to the vessel's hull, even if it doesn't break it. And there's some bigger ones that are more modern. A big one being environmental concerns. One of the reasons that these routes are so uh, available these days is because of global warming. By putting a bunch of ships up there, spewing a lot of carbon, you're probably only going to make it even worse. And who knows what pushing a bunch of ships through that particular channel could do to the wildlife and the, uh, the environment that's up there as it is. As a man that sailed, as someone who still has a lot of friends that serve in the Merchant Marine, I don't think people spend enough time understanding the deep complexities of operating in these maritime environments, the danger mm -hmm. of operating in these maritime environments, and um, how hard it is to just switch from one to another. And the last thing I'll say is we've been seeing a lot of, in American news, not in European news, believe it or not, but in American news, of the continued buildup and militarization of the Arctic by the Russians. I think this has something to do with it. How they see this as, um, you know, if the new Suez Canal were to happen, their ability to secure it for their own purposes back and forth to China. So I don't know, Doug. I'm not a big fan of this. I think that uh, as difficult as the Suez Canal was, we figured it out. And um, we shouldn't be so quick to dump a lot of money and time in investing in a route that's really only available for three months out of the year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree. The, the very first thing that comes to mind whenever we uh, were talking about this is uh, ice road truckers. <laughs> so I'm, I'm envisioning a, yeah. a new series on whatever whatever channel that thing is on. But um, I think I, I'm, I agree 100 percent with you, Pete. I think it's good fodder whenever there's so many things you can talk about with the Suez Canal situation, which is a nice hey, what else is out there and what could get some traction in a, in a short news cycle? Um, I think that it's, it's good to talk about. I don't think it's ever going to happen. Um, I think probably in the environmental impacts um, will be so politically devastating and contrary to all the things that uh, the Biden administration is moving towards and the global perspective on, uh, on climate change. It just it doesn't make sense. And I think it was just hey, what are we going to talk about other than the Suez Canal for five days? So uh, I agree 100% with you. It sounds good, too risky, too expensive, too much money. Now let's hope we put a, a nail in this one for a while and make it go away. But now that you're back, speaking of people that were away, Doug, I, I'm tired of hearing myself think. I need someone to give me a good topic. So why don't you All hit right. me with your first topic this week? I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. It's related to the uh, Biden infrastructure proposal. Right. I'm sure there are t tons and tons of pundits out there. They're going to be ripping this thing apart and giving their, their two cents. And this monumental two trillion dollars, you know, a trillion is a it's a powerful word. And, and uh, transportation, Pete, he's spinning it pretty well. And I think it's good. But here's the deal. When you peel it all back. Right. And I sound like Biden when I say here's the deal. Um, first of all, I, I I think it's good. A lot of these things in there are, are, are relevant in context, right? So when you hear infrastructure, I'm thinking roads and airports and ports and the infrastructure to move things. There's a lot of stuff in here that really is not infrastructure related. And um, kind of if you peel things back, uh, I made some notes that, you know, the transportation and infrastructure piece, there's really four components, transportation and infrastructure. There's a quality of life at home is what people have turned it which is like public housing and electric grids and water safety, which I guess it's infrastructure, but it's not the traditional one that we've used in the past. There's a whole section about caregivers and the elderly. I'm not really sure how that, that applies. And then R&D and manufacturing, which I guess you could have a dotted line to it. So there's a lot of stuff that's on top of this that I think will get uh, spun out uh, during this discussion. But specific to the infrastructure, you know, I, it was about... 25% of the $600 billion is related to e uh, electric vehicles and, and things of that nature. But when you get to the blocking and tacking, there's about 25% or so that's really related to fixing bridges, fixing roads, improving the port system, improving airports, safety, things of that nature, which is all the boxes I would traditionally check and say that is infrastructure. So although it's $2 trillion and it sounds like a big number and 
transportation, Pete's going to rock it and really promote it, which is fine. Um, when you peel back the onion, it's really, uh, you know, about a, I don't know, two trillion or a $200 billion project. It's not that monumental. So it's good. It's a proposal. We'll see how it shakes out. But the meat and potatoes, from my perspective, is a very, very small percentage of what this $2 trillion is. Yeah, Doug, this was a, I have a lot of moments in my daily life where I say to myself, I really just should not have said anything about something. And I don't know if you saw, but I put something on LinkedIn about this where I opened my big fat mouth and I said, I actually spent time reading through this. So unlike a lot of people who, who post before they talk, um, before they think about something, you know, I, um, I read it and I went through the numbers and, you know, there's some examples in, in the first draft and we should all keep in mind, this is a draft, right? This is not, this has not gone through the legislative process. So who knows what it'll look like on the other end? As you mentioned, you know, this will look very different probably. But um, I was excited when I first heard about it because for the last couple of weeks, Doug, we've been talking about the need to invest in port infrastructure and in roads, bridges, and how unsexy it generally is, but it, it does create jobs and it will absolutely help with port congestion. Um, but you know, you look at it, $174 billion for the promotion of electric vehicles. And a lot of that money a lot of that money goes into um, ports for charging electric vehicles. And uh, not to poo-poo that because I'm a big fan of EVs. I don't know if I'll ever own one um, just because I am a gearhead and I don't know what I'm looking at when I look at one of those cars. But boy, do I love riding in them. And man, do I dig the technology. Uh, but I digress. Then I looked at ports and I couldn't believe that it was like $17 billion. $17 billion in this massive infrastructure bill where every time they talk about it, they talk about port and airports, right? The Mobile, Alabama modernization program was $5 billion. So a, a small port that very few people even realize is an operable port, to renovate that would have taken up, you know, close to a third of all of that. Do you, do you have any idea the kind of money that we could dump into just a, a I mean, just to put into, let's say, Long Beach, or if you wanted to go into San Francisco, which could really use a renovation, Seattle, what we could do with an awesome port like that to dump some money into it, right? I mean, you want to talk about a great port that we could do even more with. Um, airports, you know? I mean, I think Denver's probably the newest port, uh, airport in America, right? And what we could do to make that an even more viable air, air cargo port. Chicago, what they need to do there to expand on runways. I mean, the, the amount of money. Then you go into bridges and roads, it was 117 billion. So you're gonna put less money into roads and bridges than you are into charging for EVs. And, and then, you know, the, the argument you get back, which I got a lot of them on Twitter and a lot of them on LinkedIn from direct messages from people was, if you don't create the infrastructure for this next economy, we're not gonna have it. And I, I understand the premise of that comment but we shouldn't be selling a new economy until we can prepare for the economy that we currently have. We can't deal with the volumes that we currently have. And you're trying to convince me to create a brand new infrastructure for something that we're not even, we're not even dealing with now. I, I have a very difficult time with that when our ports and the, the link from the port to the rest of the country, these, these dominant roles of the of the gate to the bridge to the rest of the world that that simple highway is in such disarray not to mention rail you know mm -hmm. which i guess you're going to talk about in a little bit here but i mean what a what a mess and this is where mm -hmm. we decide to spend our money it was really disheartening and um i'm with you doug i i know this is politics i know it's also part of just trying to dump money into the economy after what was an absolute killer with this covid um but man I hope that what comes out of this pays more attention to what is really transportation infrastructure and a lot less of what I feel is more political pandering. Because once both sides of the political game get a hold of this, they're going to find some pretty creative ways to call this stuff infrastructure spending. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's two for two, Pete, as far as us agreeing on our topics. Usually it's, uh, the <laughs> that's good. That means great minds think alike. So uh, good deal. All right, so number three. Uh, what you got? Ball's back in your court. 
Well, number three for me comes down to something that just, uh, it, it seems to get worse rather than better, and it's the concept of anti-dumping tariffs. When you are watching global trade and you watch it closely, it starts off as a trickle of information that there's, there's something that the USTR, something that commerce, you know, that we're looking at that appears to be being sold in this country at a price that isn't fair, that there's a, a foreign government who is subsidizing the production and export of a good to America at a price in order to drive out domestic competition. You keep seeing it, you keep seeing it, you keep seeing it. And then eventually the U.S. government takes action on it and bam, we get hit with these 200, 300, 400 percent tariffs. And everyone's been whining about the 301 tariffs and with good reason. They were terrible coming out of China. But man, did we have a lot of anti-dumping and countervailing duties over the past, of the course of the past eight years. It wasn't just Trump. President Obama got in there too. But President Trump definitely raised the stakes. And now it appears that even over Obama, this is also going to continue to be the case. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're brutal on, on companies because they take forever to decide. And while these decisions are being made, we're keeping track of who's importing what. And you can end up paying one gnarly bill while the decision's being made. Because as those imports are coming in, we're keeping track of what came in, and you could be hit with those tariffs after the fact. So if importers are not paying attention on the orders of what could be hit with these countervailing duties, they need to start paying attention. And unfortunately, these could become bond issues. These could also become issues with, with um, trade compliance. And I'm telling you right now, a lot of customs house brokers are not doing a very good job of keeping their clients informed of what could be coming down the pike. So if you're a major importer, and you're involved in a lot of particularly Asian imports, I'd start paying attention to what's coming down the pike with regards to countervailing and anti-dumping duties. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, uh, the big guys, right, I put it in two categories. Uh, larger companies that are importing, that get it, that have departments to manage it, to create awareness and, and raise the flags. Um, they're making strides to, you know, we're gonna stay in China, but we're gonna expand and have the, the, the uh, capacity and the resources to look elsewhere and are managing it. And then there's the smaller, medium-sized companies that are just trying to keep things moving and keep freight moving and, and paying the bills that probably don't have no clue of what, uh, what we're talking about. And those are the ones I think that could really, those are the type of companies that could really get nailed on the, on the back end. Just, you know, I'm looking 15 feet in front of me. I got to pay my bills. I got to pay my employees. I got so much stuff coming at me because the consumer buying habits, just move it through, move it through, move it through, uh, and not taking a, a, a stop to kind of see what could potentially happen uh, with these anti-dumping and, and uh, countervalence type of things. So I think the small guys kind of going to get hosed on this um, when, uh, when it comes to, comes to light. Yeah, they could close their businesses down if they don't watch it. Mm -hmm. So they're the ones where yeah. those penalties, they could be enough to put them out and ruin their cash flow for quite some time. Yeah. Hey, so, Pete, I got a question. Yeah. One more before just a, a question for you. How far back, um, this is, you know, right up your alley. How far back can, uh, uh, you go for, for penalties, right? So if I imported oh, something year, two, five, I, I don't I, know the answer to that. And I'm sure the audience would be yeah. of interest. Five years. Yeah. Customs, customs goes back for the, for the whole saw bill on that one, baby. Yeah. They go back five years, man, do they love to go back. So when they come in and they do a focused assessment, they, you better have five years of, of records and they're gonna, they can go back and audit you for as much as five years. And under the new focused assessment, new. Okay, under focused assessment, I forget it's been around for quite some time. They'll take a look at everything and if they find something wrong in one particular area of analysis, they'll drill down on it. And if it's anti-dumping, man, they start, they call their wives and husbands and say, we won't be home for a while. They get awful excited because that's, that, that's the kind of stuff that careers are made for when they find that people aren't paying attention to that one. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, right. that's not a whole lot of fun. Five all right, Dex, take us home. Take us home with number four. Speaking of all infrastructure. Right. Yeah. So here we go, man. I'm going to lay it on the line on this one, and I'm just going to throw it out there is that uh, it's related to rail. But here's, here's my premise is like, why are we continuing to talk about high speed rail in this country? Right. I think it's all right. So I'm just laying it out there, my friend. I think it's a waste of time. I think there's so much more money can be used appropriately and more efficiently. We spoke about with uh, with our topic a few minutes ago. I, I just see all of these pie in the sky um, 50 years out. Here's all the things that we could be doing with high speed rail. And you got researchers and, and engineers and educators 
we get paid to come up with all of these great plans, right? And that's all it is. It's a plan. And, and, and you look at it and the practicality is just, it doesn't make sense, right? Like to have a high speed rail that primarily moves people, right? I mean, you look at what's transpired in, in, in the last year, you don't need people to go to work. We can now bring work to people. Right, so the ability and the technology there to do my job in my pajamas in my house is more prevalent than ever. That trend has just been accelerated by the COVID, which we've talked about many, many times. I just don't understand why people care about a high-speed rail to move people from Chicago to LA. Now, I kind of get it with the East Coast. I don't live out there. I've never lived in the East Coast. I know there's trains now that go up and down the, the coast, and that's fine, right? But eminent domain and you can't just put a high speed train on this on these tracks that are they're aging i just it makes me irritated when i see that and the amount of money that goes into study and analysis and talk about the potential of the carbon footprint removal and and all, it's just pete it's nonsense and, and i'm tired of people talking about it and the ever changing focus of how people interface with others how they interface with their job Technology is going to trump some track that you put down that you can get from A to B in, in 200 miles an hour. I, I'm just tired of it. You know, it, it's a joke. Last thing I'll say on this, Pete, then I'll throw it over to you, is being in Colorado and going up to the mountains, the I-70 corridor is a disaster because of ski traffic, summer traffic, the whole nine yards. If you don't time it right, you're sitting in traffic for, for hours, three or four hours just to get up to the mountains. And there was like a couple million dollars of a study to talk about a high-speed rail, how they could zip through the mountains and build it. And the amount of money and the amount of collaboration that would have to take place between public land, private land, municipalities, and then let alone convincing people to use it, it was a joke. Nobody's going to do that. And so focus efforts, focus attention, and focus resources and money on what we need to do now, which is an infrastructure to move um, commodities, and stuff and not worry about taking people to their work let work come to the people with the technology that we realized in the last last year so anyway i'm going to get on a tangent here and really go off pete so that's my take on it i was waiting for you to have like a clint eastwood moment where you just said get off my lawn yeah yeah just just get angry that's it <laughs> el camino moment there man was it el camino was that what it was the movie yeah i think so yeah um, I couldn't disagree with you more, Doug. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> all so, right. Um, you know, I think a lot of political problems we have in this country come from a very simple concept that you've just sort of really done a great job of highlighting. And that's that a lot of problems, a lot of big problems come down to uh, people that live in more urban settings and people that live in less urban settings. This is a big urban problem. It's a big urban problem. Um, you just mentioned we have the Acela here in the Northeast. And the Acela in the Northeast didn't even live up to its expectations, unfortunately. It, the, the speed of that train doesn't go where it was supposed to. I don't believe we get anywhere near the top speed because I think it's um, it, it disturbs like the local businesses and the, the rail couldn't handle it. But still, I can get from Boston to Washington, D.C. in about five hours as opposed to driving it, which on my best drives... I'm still looking at maybe seven, eight. Uh, and I can get to Boston in about, Boston to New York in about three and a half hours. And that whole time, I park, I park my car, you know, I, I, grab, I grab a cup of coffee. There may or may not be some booze in it. Who knows? And I can sit there. I can get up when I want. I can sit back down. I can go to the, the bar car and grab a hot dog or whatever it is that I'm doing. You know, look out the window. And it is a truly civilized way to travel and get from place to place. And when I'm done, I am smack dab in the middle of New York City, in the middle of Midtown Manhattan. I walk to my meetings. It's generally less expensive. The parking is very inexpensive for me and it's, it's incredibly convenient. Now, you don't care because if you're going to go to New York, you're going to fly there. You're going to drive to, is it DIA, right? You know, you're going to hop on a yeah. plane and it's going to take you just about as much time to get to New York as it took me. And um, then you're going to get on a cab and do whatever it is that you do. But for me, going up and down the East Coast is so much easier now than it was, I guess, 10, 15 years ago because of that train. And when I go to Europe, 
I travel on trains constantly because of the speed, the reliability, and the comfort of it. And when I'm in Asia, you get on those Chinese trains, man, those magnet trains, they blast from city to city, and they're relatively inexpensive. Not that I want to give a whole lot of credit to the Chinese because we all know how I feel about their central planning. But back to the topic. There are parts of this world, like the corridor between Dallas and Houston, where they're talking about Hyperloop, which I know you cannot stand, but maybe a high-speed rail between those two would allow it to become the world's first hyper-economy where you could actually commute from one place to another. And there is nothing but dirt and despair between those two cities, man. Take it from a Texan. Uh, and places like L.A. to Las Vegas, um, you know, there, there are places where it would make sense. Where it always falls apart is what you just mentioned, which is the cost and how being able to bear the cost of everything from legal challenges, you're not building it across my backyard, to environmental um, issues. As soon as a environmental policy construct finds just the right kind of horny toad and says, we're taking you to court, we're going to keep suing you until we get around this, it delays it a great deal. So mm -hmm. I am very fortunate in that I'm in a position where I really benefit from it and I love them. But um, I see your, your anger and your frustration with them. But from my perspective as a guy who lives in a more urban setting, I find them indispensable to, to making my life easier. I'm a guy that took mm. the train to work every day when I worked in Manhattan, and I absolutely mm. loved it. Yeah. Um, but well, I could care less about the ski area. I just drive there. I live in New Hampshire, baby. Yeah. I'm not saying blow up what's there. I'm saying don't invest a whole lot of effort and time to try to recreate something. Even Get off my if it would If it would work, it would need to be regional, like you said, little pockets. Trying to connect Denver to, to the rest of the world is not – realistic maybe a dallas to houston but the challenge there is you're going through a lot you know a lot of old business down there my friend and uh you're gonna have to cut through a lot of private land and it's a whole nother shit show in that aspect so i don't want to blow up what's already there just st stop talking about a 200 mile an hour train to cut your five hour commute to four hours and 30 minutes i'm done with that man doug I what did the train do to you, man? Did you like, when you were young, did your parents not take you to see Thomas or something? You've been mad ever since. Come on. You come yeah. up here and you and I are going to take the train from Boston, New York. I'm going to take you to see a show. You're going to love it. You're yeah. Love it. Be like, I'm I like trains. trains man. I like trains. I'm just tired of people talking about how to make them faster. It already exists. Throw some of that money into the infrastructure. How do you feel about that, about, about our infrastructure for, for rail, for intermodal? Because that's, that's top that, goat rodeo too. That that's a uh, that's another topic for another show. <laughs> okay, don't don't make those companies angry, Doug. Don't make those right. companies angry. Nothing's going to make those companies angry. We that might be one of the only third rail topics for this show is we can't talk about rail companies. We don't want to yeah. upset anybody. Mm. Well, yeah. uh, thank you all for joining us on uh, Global Trade this week with Cap Logistics. Uh, Doug, do you have anything going on you want to plug or talk about this week? Um, not right now. We got a couple things in the works with uptime logistics. Um, we're excited to get those pumped out. So I think next show we'll be able to promote some of the things we have in the works. So we're still in the lab. We're still working on some things, but it's going to be a good spring with some good content. Great. What about you? What uh, about you? Every other week you can catch me on trade school from uh, our good friends at Tapa. So you can check them out on uh, Tapa's website. This week we'll um, be getting pretty deep into some more issues on maritime congestion. And, of course, the Trade Geek podcast is up and available anywhere you get your podcast content. Lucky you. You can always get us here at Global Trade this week. Uh, catch us both on LinkedIn. We like to put a lot of stuff there. You can always get me on Twitter at Trade Geek. Thanks so much for joining us on Global Trade this week from Cap Logistics. Thank you very much, Keenan, back in the control room for uh, hooking yep. us up. You made it all, almost an entire show without me making fun of the fact that you were a teenager behind the controls. Oh. There I went. <laughs> almost, we'll see you next almost. week. We'll trade this almost. week. Almost. Almost. Thanks. All right. See you guys. Thank you.